NBC presents transcribed Frank Lovejoy in... Night Beat. This is Randy Stone. I cover the night beat for the Chicago Star. Statistically speaking, someone once said a story is born every 15 seconds. It could be that you've got to go out in the night and dig for it. Dig behind the love and the hate and the fear. And probe for that story that fills up tomorrow's paper. I had a couple of tired items that I've been keeping for just such an occasion. I wrote them, I rewrote them, and then I threw them in the wastebasket because night beat is a matter of leg work. There's only one way to do it. Mohammed has to go to the mountain. So I put on my coat, got my hat, and started out. I was just walking out of the city room, opened the door to the hall, and I looked right into a pair of inquiring blue eyes. Pardon me. For well, sure. I-, I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for a newspaper man. Well, maybe. What's his name? Oh, I don't want anyone in particular. I just want to talk to a newspaper man. Well, you're not too particular. I'm a reporter. My name is Randy Stone. Oh. Would you be interested in a story, Mr. Stone? I might saw the mountain comes to Mohammed. What? I don't understand. Oh, it's just a figure of speech. Come on in. We can sit down and... Oh, oh no. No, I'd rather stay out here in the hall. Okay, well, let's hear it. Wait. Uh, is it true that newspapers will pay money to get a big story? A really big story? Well, they've been known to if it's important enough and if it's an exclusive. How much would they pay? Well, look, I can't set a price. That's up to the publisher. And besides, it depends. But what do you have to sell? I'm married to a communist spy. Oh. Well, why tell me? Why don't you go to the FBI? Well, they won't pay anything. I've got to have money. And you've got to promise me you won't tell them until after you've paid me. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hold on here. If you've got a story, my boss will be happy to buy an exclusive, but not behind the government's back. Oh, you can tell the FBI. I didn't mean you couldn't give them the facts, but we've got to be safe first. Don't you see? We've got to be safe. Now, wait a minute. Now, before everybody gets in an uproar, let's find out if you have got a story. Where is your husband? I'll take you to him. In my trade, you can't ever afford to overlook a lead because the most implausible thing turns out to be true and the most plausible, phony. I went down the elevator with the girl. And it stopped on the ground floor. We walked across the lobby and out onto the sidewalk. And as usual, there was no cab in front. Mine walking around the corner of the cab stand, Mrs. Uh, you didn't tell me your name. It's Jane. Mrs. Jane Grish. No, I don't mind walking. How long have you known about your husband? Mr. Stone, there's somebody following us. No, no, there's nobody. Yes, there is. Back there. We just stepped in the shadows of that doorway. Oh, yes, there is someone. You wait for me at the cab stand. She went on ahead. I stopped and went through my pockets like I'd forgotten something, and then I started back, walking close to the buildings. When I came to the doorway where the man had melted into the shadows, I stopped. Something I can do for you, bud? Hello, Stone. Uh, Louis Martel. Aren't you in the wrong neighborhood? I want to talk to you. I'm busy. See me tomorrow. You'll see me now. Or am I pointed enough? Louis, when are you going to quit sticking a gun in people's ribs? Don't you know that smart thugs don't do that anymore? Maybe I'm not smart, but I'm effective. You know what I mean? And I got my eye on you, Stone, so play ball. Well, what is that supposed to mean? That column you wrote yesterday. The boys didn't like it. They told me to tell you they didn't like it. That's the highest praise I've ever had. Now, if you don't mind, I'm in a hurry. When I'm ready. You said in the paper we was in for a surprise. You said somebody was going to push us out of business. Where'd you get that idea? Professional secrets. I never divulge the source of my information. What kind of stuff is that? I'm like a doctor or a lawyer. How would you like it if I knew something about you and I spilled? Wouldn't be very nice of me, would it? No. It wouldn't be healthy either. I right, get out of my way, Louie. Go play hood someplace else. Okay. But keep something in mind, Stone. Don't hold out on us. You know, even cops get hurt sometimes. Yeah, I'll keep it in mind. Mm-hmm. 
I walked away from the gunsel. By the time I got around the corner, the adrenaline in my body had subsided to something like normal because I'm no different than anybody else. You stick a gun in my ribs and I turn cold inside. By the time I got to the cab stand, Mrs. Grease wasn't there. But I wasn't especially surprised. If she had been telling the truth, she'd run out of fear. And if she hadn't, well, you run into it all the time. Somebody promises you a great story and it blows up in your face. I walked along the street wondering if she'd been on the level or if it was all a lot of hogwash. Either way, I still had a story to dig up before the night was over. I'd walked about two blocks and was crossing the street when a cab pulled up. Mr. Stone. Mrs. Grace. Get in. I thought you'd taken a powder on me. Who was that man who was following me? He wasn't following you. He was following me. Why? Why should he follow you? Oh, it's nothing. Forget it. Just a cheap thug who's sore over some publicity I gave him. I think you're shaking him. I don't see him anywhere. You know, I'm beginning to believe you're serious about this cloak and dagger stuff. Yes, Mr. Stone. I'm dead serious. And you'd sell your husband down the river for a few pieces of gold. Must be a great love. You don't understand. Rudy wants to quit. He wants the American people to know. He must make them realize the danger before it's too late. He wants to help them. He does? Oh, he realizes he's done a lot of harm to America, but he, he couldn't help himself. Oh, they uh, twisted his arm? They sent him here from Czechoslovakia. They told him all kinds of lies. I see, and now he's seen the light. I'm afraid you don't believe me. Well, if what you say is true and he's so anxious to square the books, why didn't he come himself? He's afraid. He's in constant fear. Of what? The secret police. But in Chicago? I know what you're thinking. When I lived in Kansas, I wouldn't have believed it either. But Rudy's country, well, things are different. You can't know what it's like, Mr. Stone, to know you're being spied on, to, to wonder who's going to kill you and when. It seems to me what you need is protection, not money. If you're not interested, Mr. Stone, maybe I ought to go to another paper. No, I didn't say that I wasn't interested, but... One thing I don't quite get, and it makes me skeptical. When we splash the story on the front page, what good is the money going to do you? With money, we can lose our kids. I know where we can get a little farm. Way off the beaten track. In Kansas? Please don't ask me. I can't tell you. Incidentally, where is this cloak and dagger operation going on? At the circus. The circus? Yes. Rudy's the clown. The high-wire clown. <laughs> She didn't talk the rest of the way to the circus lot. She just sat and stared moodily out of the window. The circus was in progress when we got there. Had about half an hour to go before it broke. Mrs. Grease took me in through the back way, zigzagging between performance trailers to a dressing room tent. The well-known clown alley. She pulled me back into the shadows as four or five clowns passed on their way to the big cup. Now, would you be alone if you go in? We walked into the tent, past the long rows of dressing tables and mirrors, to the end, where a man, wearing the most incredibly melancholy clown makeup, sat staring into a mirror. Rudy, I brought someone to talk to you. Oh? To talk to me? What about? You know, Rudy. You know what about. My name is Stone, Mr. Grease. Randy Stone. I'm with the Chicago Star. Your wife has told me that... Rudy, I was right. They pay for stories. They sometimes pay quite a lot if they can have a story exclusively. What an incredible country this is. Imagine paying money for news. Well, of course, we'll have to have proof. Rudy, my friend, is it not time for... Oh, did not know you have company. Well, that's all right, Kovacs. You are on in a few minutes, Rudy. Yes, I know. Every day I'm on at the same time. I'm not likely to forget. That is good. I only come to remind you of your duty. Mm. Excuse me. Who is that man, Rudy? But that is Kovacs, you know, Kovacs. Rudy, I've never seen him before in my life. Oh, Jane, why do you not go to your tent and rest? Relax like the no. doctor told you. Doctor. Rudy, what are you trying to do to me? Uh, about the story, we'll have to have documentation of every fact you give us. What is this documentation that I give you? No, I don't, I don't understand. Well, we just can't print that you're a spy. We'll have to substantiate it. Spy? Jane, is that what... Did you tell this man that I was a spy? Rudy... Rudy, please. He can help us. Jane, you go to your quarters. But, Rudy, I... Jane, you do as I tell you. Rudy. Not 
don't worry, Mr. Stone. It should be all right. He's not been well. He fell from a trapeze, you know. It's very serious for damage to the brain. Oh? The poor Jane has it in her mind that I need money to disappear because I'm afraid of the communist secret police. Uh, I suppose she told you this. Yeah. Mm. Did she tell you I was chosen as a master spy because of the freedom with which I travel with the circus? That I'm used as a clearing house for all espionage in your country? That I'm in contact with the head of the underground in every major city and that I am indeed the most important spy in America? Well, no, no, she wasn't quite that explicit. Here, according to Jane, my life is not worth what you Americans call a plug nickel. Hmm. That must have been some fall she took. It was unfortunate. Any minute she expects none other than Mavlik to appear and eliminate me. Mavlik? The big iron curtain hatchet man? <laughs> Fantastic, no? In poor Jane, she worries more about foreign intrigue than the State Department. No, Mr. Stone, I'm afraid I'm just a clown. I'm just a simple clown who knows how to stay on a high wire without falling off and breaking his neck. Huh? I'm sorry I've been caused so much trouble. I have to go now. I'm on in a few minutes. Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Why, uh, why do you look at me like that so searchingly? I was just wondering what you look like under the makeup. Well, I'm just an ordinary fellow, Mr. Stone, like anybody. No, there's no story in me, Mr. Stone. He walked out of Clown Alley, and I stood there a while, feeling like a left tackle had been taken out of the play. Big international story, and it ends up to be a mental mirage. I heard a big laugh go up. Somebody was having fun. And since I'd gone to all the trouble to come to the circus, the least I could do was to catch Rudy's act. I slipped into the big top, feeling like a kid who sneaked in for free. And from the performer's entrance, I watched Rudy, the clown with a sad face, high on the top of the tent, killing the crowd with his crazy antics on the high wire. He'd take a couple of clumsy, uncertain steps. He'd start the fall with no net beneath him. The crowd shrieked. He grabbed the wire, regained his footing, scratched his ribs with one hand and his head with the other. And they roared with laughter. Then they shrieked again, but this time they didn't laugh because there wasn't anything to laugh about. Because Rudy wasn't on the high wire anymore. Rudy had plummeted to the ground. I pushed my way through the tan bark to the ring. I was in the inner circle of the circus people who stood looking down at Rudy with the awesome realization that it might have happened to any one of them. He wasn't dead, but his back was broken. They carried him on a stretcher to the medical tent. I waited outside. A worried-looking red-faced man came up. How is he? Bad. Doc says it's just a matter of minutes. Say, I don't know you, do I? I'm Randy Stone, a newspaper man. Jumping, your booty. I need you like I need a hole in the head. Soft pedal this, Mac, will you? Go easy. Puts a jinx on a show when there's been an accident. Who are you? Me, I'm Cassidy. I own this outfit. And with the season we've had and a thing like this happening, I... What would you say your name was? Stone. Randy Stone. Oh, then you must be the guy he's asking for. Who? Rudy. You'd better go in there. Wait a minute, Cassidy. Where's his wife? She ought to be in here. Wife? He hasn't got a wife. Are you sure? Look, I know who's with his show and who isn't. But he told me... Look, that... if you want to talk to him, you'd better go in there. Stone? Oh, Mr. Stone. I'm here. I'm right here. Are you alone? Yeah. I haven't much time. Listen carefully. Don't let anything happen to Jane. They mustn't do anything to Jane. Who, oh, Rudy? Who would hurt Jane? Kovac. Mavlik. It's all true what I what I said. Jane imagined. It's all true. If we thought we could get a farm, it would have been nice farm. Lose ourselves. But you don't... You, you, you can't. Uh, there's no hiding. Easy, easy. Now, take it easy. They'll get her, Mr. Stone, and you must protect her. I'll do what I can. Kept it secret, our marriage to protect her, but it was wrong. Wrong to dream. There are no secrets from Mavlik. Rudy, what happened up there on the high wire? How did you fall? 
My shoe. My shoe? Rudy. Rudy. He was all through talking. His eyes, the only real part of his grotesque, chalk-white face, closed as I stood looking down at him. The whole thing seemed like a fantasy. It was weird and unreal. I felt like the ball on the pinball machine that's been bounced off every post without scoring. As I stepped back away from him, I saw the only thing that made sense. His shoe. The sole of it had been cut and stitched back, but off-center. This was no accident. This was murder. Yeah, the clown is dead. Long live the clown. NBC is bringing you Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. As a civilian at home, what is your obligation to a soldier in a foxhole in Korea? Maybe you haven't considered that question. If you haven't, it's understandable. The foxhole in Korea is a pretty remote, after all, from your everyday life. And it wouldn't help if you were constantly worrying. But if you've stopped to consider it, the least we can do here at home in the States is to help keep America financially strong. That's the best way to back up the men in the Army, Navy, and Air Force. One of the best ways to help keep America financially strong is to buy United States defense bonds regularly. If you think you can't afford it, Look into the payroll savings plan where you work, and you'll probably change your mind. You can have any amount you specify saved from each paycheck. When there's enough for a defense bond, it's purchased and turned over to you. And remember, today, defense bonds offer you more interest, a quicker return on your money. They're now even better. Invest more in defense bonds. And now back to Nightbeat. And Randy Stone. A clown falls off a high wire and dies. This is a story. But not the story that pulled me to the circus. I was interested now in his wife. What had happened to the wife of Rudy Grish, the girl who had been so mortally afraid for him? Why hadn't she been there when he died? These were some of the things I tried to find out from Cassidy. So Rudy had a shoe repair. That doesn't prove anything. He was a tight wad. He never spent money on anything. I have a feeling even a tightwad would spend money on his shoes if his life depended on them. Hey, what are you reaching for, Stone? You think somebody in my show killed him? Now, that's for the cops to figure out. What do you know about Rudy Grish? Well, not much. He was a good performer. How did he happen to come with you? He was in this country on a visa. He was anxious to work, so I hired him. I got him cheap. When he was on the road, you ever notice anything suspicious about him? Did he meet people on the outside? Did he... Leave the circus a lot? Now, look, I've got my hands full pushing this pile of canvas around the country without worrying where my performers go. His wife claims that he was a communist spy. That's crazy. That's absolutely nuts. He didn't have a wife. Well, he said different. How about a tall blonde girl named Jane? Used to be an aerial. Jenny? Yeah. Well, she's not married. Oh, Rudy was nice to her, but we all were. She took a bad fall last year, hit her head. Has never been the same since. We keep her around here because we're sorry for her. Well, where is she now? Where can I find her? Well, you might try the wardrobe tent. That's where she works. But she wasn't at the wardrobe tent. I checked all over the lot. I couldn't find her anywhere. The circus grounds were almost deserted. The crowds were gone. The performers had disappeared into that world of tents and trailers. It belongs exclusively to them. Everything was battened down except the shooting gallery. As I passed by it, one man was putting out the lights and racking up the guns. The man who had reminded Rudy of his entrance cue, Kovacs. Do not move. Stand where you are. I could barely see him in the dim light, but what I saw made me do exactly as he ordered. He had a rifle trained on me. Come over here. Close. No, don't put your hands in your pockets. Put them on the counter. That's fine. What do you want? I understand you're looking for Mrs. Grish. Yeah. I will take you to her. Well, never mind that. Just tell me where she is. You seem to misunderstand, Mr. Stone. I said I will take you to her. 
He backed away from me. He racked the rifle. But as quickly as he put it away, another gun appeared in his hand. A Luger. If you make any attempt to run, to get away, to scream, I will kill you. Now, walk straight ahead of me down midway to that car parked on the corner. He came out of the booth with his top coat draped over the hand that held the gun. There was something European about the cut of his suit, but other than that and his accent, he was like any other hood, frightening with a gun in his hand. No, no. You drive. Well, why don't you drive? Or don't you know how to handle an American car? There is no need to be insolent. Get in. Drive. I will tell you where to go. I thought I knew Chicago, but so did my friend with the Luger. He gave the directions, and I followed them. North on Lakeshore Drive, left on Randolph, down Michigan, over to State Street, and back to Michigan. We didn't cover much territory. Actually, we kept circling around the same area. Pretty soon he got tired of it, or else he felt safe. We drove back the way we'd come, past Grant Park, Shedd Aquarium, Soldiers Field. And there, at the far end of the circus encampment, out of hearing of any other trailers, we stopped at a luxury house trailer parked on the lakefront. He got out of the car, held the door open for me. And we walked to the trailer steps. Go on. Open the door. Now step inside. Mr. Stone! Mr. Stone! It was Mrs. Jane Grish. I recognized her from the clothes she wore. It would have been hard to recognize her from her face. It had been beaten almost beyond recognition. She was huddled in the corner, sobbing. And seated comfortably on the couch, smoking a cigarette, was an overly handsome, blonde young man. Come in, come in. Close the door, Kovacs. Well, Mr. Stone, it was nice of you to come with Kovacs. But then Kovacs has always been inordinately persuasive. From the looks of Mrs. Grisha's face, I'd say that you were pretty persuasive yourself. I have that reputation. You wouldn't be mad like, would you? Oh, you have heard of me. This I do not like. Mavlik, he knows about the shoe. Oh, your, your situation becomes more and more unfortunate, Mr. Stone. But you are just in time for what you Americans call uh, the second show. Mrs. Grish, <laughs> where is the information that your husband has collected for us? I don't know. I told you I don't know. You're lying, Mrs. Green. I don't know. I don't know anything. You do know. I don't even know what you're talking about. Then let me refresh your memory. Rudy Grease was sent here for a very definite purpose. To correlate information from our scattered agents all over the country. And to pass this information on to us. And he did his job well until he married you. That was his mistake. No. You made the mistake. It wasn't me. I didn't change his mind. He was being able to go from state to state without showing papers, to do what he wanted without asking permission. For the first time in his life, think for himself. All right, if you won't cooperate, we go back to the first way. <laughs> Leave her alone. Kovacs, hold him. Why, you stupid, let go of me. Don't be so impatient, Mr. Stone. Your turn is next. <laughs> scream, scream all you want. No one was here. Please, please. I'll tell you anything. If you promise, leave Rudy alone. <laughs> of course we will, my dear. That is the information. <laughs> Don't sell out, Mrs. Grish. It's too late. Rudy's dead. 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 Shut up. Uh, you shouldn't have killed him. Now you'll never find out because I don't know. No one knew but Rudy. Rudy. He was with Rudy when he died. Maybe he told him. Excellent collection. Well, Mr. Stone, aren't you uh, frightened? Of what? Thugs like you? Don't get me wrong. I'm no hero, but I cut my teeth on your caliber. This is Chicago, remember? <laughs> yes. Yes, I've seen your gangster movies. Effective, but blunt. Very blunt, indeed. You will see we are going to give you a night you won't forget. I'm sure I can depend on it. Oh, yes. Yes, you can depend on it. Like you can depend on our one day liberating your people, too, from your antiquated ideals. <laughs> 
it weren't so ironic, it'd be funny. Huh, it amuses you? No, no, not that. I'm just thinking about a guy I know, name of Louis Martel. His biggest worry in life is that some other gang might take over one little neighborhood in Chicago. When we take over, it will be definite, conclusive. It will be everything. Well, this you'll have to prove. Don't worry, Stone. They'll never make it. The Marines had landed. It was the right entrance, but the wrong character. Louis Martel standing in the doorway with an automatic in his hand. Why? Well, you're the guys that are going to take over, huh? Who that? No, you don't, sweetheart. Ah, no. ah, that's what happens to guys who try to muscle in. Now, you, Stone, you're quite a cute character. Thought you'd check me, huh? Trying to lose me at the circus while you made contact with these out-of-town punks. You got it all wrong, Louis. Yeah, sure. Now, the point is, what am I going to do about you? And the dame. Louis, behind you, look out. Won't work, Stone. Kovac's going to shoot. That's as old as... <laughs> Dirty rat! In the back... A great international story. I believed it. I bought it. But I couldn't print it because I couldn't prove it. The cops? They pegged it for a gang killing and you couldn't blame them. That's how it looked. Three dead hoodlums. I told them the blonde man was Mavlik. They thought it was plausible and interesting. But his identification read, Herman Kennedy, Pittsburgh. They almost believed me when Mrs. Grish backed me up, that is, until they checked and found out that She'd had a bad fall and hadn't been the same since. Oh, they were nice about it. They told me to come back if I ever got any proof. Fat chance. But there is one interesting slant to the whole case. Louis Martel, gangster, killer. Yet, although he never got to know it, in life's crazy way, he was the right guy in the right place at the right time. And for a brief moment, became a hero. Copy, boy. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy, is produced and directed by Warren Lewis. Tonight's transcribed story was written by John and Gwen Bagney with music by Robert Armbruster. Featured in tonight's cast were George Ellis, Bill Conrad, Ben Wright, Sidney Miller, and Lou Merrill. Don Rickles speaking. Listen next week at this time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. Night Beat came to you from Hollywood. Chimes mean good times on NBC. Every Friday evening on most NBC stations, you'll hear a trio of stellar shows for your listening enjoyment. For top satire and lots of laughs, it's Inside Bob and Ray, the two boys from Boston who won this year's Peabody Award for top radio achievement in their field. For music, tune for the Mario Lanza Show with his guest, Margaret Whiting. And for...